Okay guys, so in this lesson, um, you're going to get a review for the Unit 2 exam, um, Unit 2 exam on nuclear chemistry. Uh, question number one, let's get started. Which isotope will spontaneously decay and emit particles with a charge of positive two? So you can definitely use table um, M for this one. Um, and also maybe table O, it just depends on how much you remember. But um, the only nuclear particle that has a charge of positive 2 um, as a decay um, particle is the alpha particle. Um, now, if you did not remember that, then you could always check table O. But um, alphas are the only ones that have a charge of 2. And you would need to also use table N to figure out which of the particles of these choices actually decays using alpha decay. Um, one hint is that elements with really large mass numbers, like francium-220, tend to decay by alpha decay. Um, but you can check table N to confirm that. But I, I'm going to go ahead and say that it's choice 4, francium-220. Next. Positrons are spontaneously emitted from the nuclei of. Okay, so positrons have um, no mass, and they have a charge of positive 1, and there's no real pattern for um, which elements will decay via positron decay, but it would be something light. So I can definitely, I can almost certainly say it's not going to be radium-226 or thorium-232, but... Um, I can just check table N to see which one it will be. So I just went ahead and checked table N and I was able to find out that um, potassium 37 or K37, it does decay using positron decay. So um, for number two, my answer is choice one. Now, which of these types of radiation has the greatest penetrating power? Um, remember, Higher penetrating power is associated with having very low mass and also no charge. And I'll go ahead and cross out the particles that don't meet the criteria very well. So first of all, alpha is has mass and charge, so it's not that. Betas and positrons don't have mass, but they do have charge. And that leaves me just with gamma as my only option. Gammas have... Um, a symbol like that, and their mass is zero, and their charge is also zero. All right, we have a half-life question. I love these. So, based on reference table N, what is the fraction of a sample of potassium-42 that will remain unchanged after 62 hours? So here's my general strategy. Um, I know that it's been decaying for 62 hours, and I do need to know the length of a single half-life of potassium-42 in order for me to find out how many half-lives it's actually been through. So on table N, I'm seeing that the half-life is 12.36. Um, hours. And of course, this was also hours. And I'm going to divide 62 by 12.36. And I will get about five half-lives. Now, this question right here is pretty old. It's a lot older than the reference table that you guys have. And um, back when this question was written, the half-life that we thought would that would be accurate for potassium forty-two, we thought it was 12.4, so that old hat, that old table would have had 12.4 hours on it, and it would have come out to be exactly 5. But um, just know that if you see a discrepancy um, and it's not quite coming out to be a whole number, you can definitely um, round it to the nearest whole number. And it's just an issue of an old reference table and a newer question, or an old question and a newer reference table. So in any case, after 5 half-lives, I want to know what fraction actually remains. So I'm going to put in um, the fraction 1 half, and I'm going to write it five times, and that's going to represent five half-lives. So I just went ahead and did that. I have uh, one half-life, two half-lives, three, four, five half-lives. 
And um, when you multiply those fractions together, you just sort of uh, multiply through on the top, and then you multiply through on the bottom. And I'm getting 1 over 32, um, because down here on the bottom it's a 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16, times 2 is 32. So that's my 1 over 32, and uh, that would be my final answer, 1 over 32 is what remains. All right, let's do another one. Which radioisotope undergoes beta decay and has a half-life of less than one minute? So beta decay tends to be in the lighter nuclides, um, such as nitrogen-16 has beta decay. I just checked table N for that. Phosphorus-32 looks like it's also beta decay, so it's in the running. Francium-220 is most likely alpha, that we can check. Um, yep, yeah, it's alpha decay. And then potassium-42 is also beta decay. So it could be one of these three. And we just have to choose the one whose half-life is less than a minute. And I do see that nitrogen-16 has a half-life of just a few seconds, 7.13 seconds. So I'm going to go with nitrogen-16 as my final answer. All right, number six. Which product of nuclear decay has mass but no charge? Easy. It has mass, but it has no charge. A great example of that could be a neutron, so like a mass of one with a charge of zero. Let's see if that's an answer choice. It is, neutrons. So neutron would be the answer there. Types of nuclear reactions include fission, fusion, and. Okay, so fission and fusion are both really specific types of transmutation, but there is just an in general description of some nuclear reactions as being transmutation because um, transmutation would just mean that one element has changed into a different element, and that's really common in nuclear reactions. So transmutation is going to be my answer here. Which statement best describes what happens in a fission reaction? All right, so in fission reactions, you have a heavy nucleus, and that splits into um, some lighter, lighter nuclei, which are not necessarily light, but they're lighter than the heavy one. Um, and all kinds of other stuff happens, but that's the basic description. So that's basically exactly what I... Um, Choice one is basically exactly what I just said. So I'm thinking the answer is probably choice one. Number nine, which equation represents a fusion reaction? So fusion would be the opposite of fission. It's when you would take these two lightweight nuclei and then they would fuse together and form a heavier nucleus. So of the choices that I'm seeing um, here, the only one that definitely looks like fusion to me is choice three. I'm trying to circle it really carefully for you. I know that um, lots of students in the past have chosen um, this guy, choice two, as an example of fusion because they see that the carbon and the oxygen are coming together to make carbon dioxide. But um, the thing I would like you to notice when you're wondering whether or not that's fusion is that you have carbon on the left and you have carbon on the right of the arrow and you have oxygen on the left and on the right of the arrow. So since no transmutation has occurred, that reaction is not even, it's not a nuclear reaction at all, and therefore it cannot be fusion. So um, we will learn about what kind of reaction that is, but um, it's a chemical reaction. It's not a nuclear reaction. Lastly, on this page, in a nuclear fusion reaction, the mass of the product will be Okay, so you, this is going to be sort of a flashback from your lesson on fission and fusion, but there was something in that lesson called the mass defect. Um, and the mass defect basically just says that um, in any nuclear reaction that some of the um, matter is converted into energy. So 
That happens in any nuclear reaction. Now, I know that they're being really specific here and they're saying a nuclear fusion reaction. And I think that's they're saying that in order to potentially throw you off. But just know that in any nuclear reaction that you're going to be losing matter. Um, some matter will be lost as you're converting matter into energy. So um, it doesn't matter that it's fusion here. What matters is that it's nuclear. And a nuclear reaction will result in a bit less mass at the end. So um, the mass of the products is always going to be lighter than the mass of the reactants in any nuclear reaction. So um, I have to take out choice three and four. And then choice one and two both say less than the mass of the, um, of the reactants. Um, but then the difference is going to be in the wording for the rest of it. So in number one, it says less than the mass of the reactants because some of the mass has been converted to energy. That's true. And then choice two says less than the mass of the reactants because some of the energy has been converted to mass. That's not true. Energy is not converted to mass in a nuclear reaction. Mass is converted to energy. So my final answer is choice one. All right, number 11. Which statement explains why nuclear waste materials may pose a problem? So um, the main reason why nuclear waste materials pose a problem is because they have long half-lives. And when they have really long half-lives, that means they stay radioactive in the environment for a very long time. That means that choice one and two can't be it. Um, but choice three and four are in the running because they both say long half-lives. Um, but if you have a long half-life you would not be radioactive for a brief period of time. You would be radioactive for an extended or a long period of time. So my answer is choice four. Number 12, the decay of which radioisotope can be used to estimate the age of the fossilized remains, so that's the key word there, of an insect. Um, fossilized remains of an insect. That means that it was a living or a once living thing, which means that it is made of carbon. And some carbons are carbon-14. Most of them are carbon-12, but some are carbon-14. And carbon-14 is really useful in dating organic remains, like this insect, this fossilized insect. So carbon-14 is my answer. Which radioactive isotope is used in geological dating? So geology makes you think about rocks and stuff like that. Um, and the best radioisotope for um, measuring um, decay in rocks is uranium-238. I like to think that 238 is to date. Number 14. The course of a chemical reaction can be traced by using a radioisotope. And the radioisotope uh, that we would be use, using for that is called a tracer. Probably not very surprisingly based on the question. Um, yeah, that's all I really have to say about that one. Um, 15, the radioisotope iodine-131. So this is an example of a specific thing that you need to know. Iodine-131 is particularly useful in diagnosing and treating thyroid disorders. Um, and I see the word thyroid here in choice three, so I'm going to go with choice three. Number 16. Radioisotopes used for medical diagnosis must have. All right, so you do not want um, a radioisotope with a long half-life because that means it'll be in the body for a long time. And it's radioactive for a long time, so definitely not one, definitely not two. Um, and then I see in choice four, it says short half-lives. That's good. But then it says slowly eliminated by the body, and you wouldn't want that if it's radioactive. So choice three is the best answer because it says quickly eliminated by the body. Number 17. In the reaction, beryllium-9 and a uh, missing particle X yields lithium-6 and helium-4. They want to know what the X represents. So you do a little bit of algebra, and if you're just looking at the uh, mass numbers, which are the top numbers, not the, um, not the bottom numbers, which are charges, um, I'll just do mass first, 
it's uh, my algebraic equation would say 9 plus a yields 6 plus 4. And then for the z's, or the, uh, the charges, I'm seeing 4 plus z yields 3 plus 2. And with a little bit of algebra, I'm basically saying 9 plus a is 10. And I'm saying that 4 plus z is 5. So I definitely know that a is 1 right there. And I know that z is also 1. So the only particle I know that has a mass of 1 and a charge of 1, it's not particle x, it's going to be a proton, where you could use the symbol h with a mass of 1 and a charge of 1. Um, I see that choice here, number 2. Okay, number 18. Um, number 18 is an example of a question that is a half-life question, but it doesn't use a radioisotope that's on table N, but keep in mind that you can use this table um, that's in the question. So these are not necessarily table N isotopes. Some of them may be, some of them might not be, but um, just don't forget to use the data that you're given. And um, number 18, it says, it could take up to 60 hours for a radioisotope to be delivered to the hospital from the laboratory where it is produced. What fraction of an original sample of sodium-24, which is this guy, remains unchanged after 60 hours? Now, it says that sodium-24 has a half-life of 15 hours, but it's decaying theoretically for 60 hours. So, decaying for 60 hours but the half-life is 15 hours. That means that it's been through four full half-lives. And one of the things I like to do is just write out the fraction one-half four times and then multiply through, multiply through to see what fraction remains. Um, so I would say just two times two is four, times two is eight, times another two is 16. So the fraction that remains is 1 16th. And um, that's, that's my answer because the question did read what fraction. So I'm just going to go with 1 16th as my answer. All right, next question. It says, write the equation for the nuclear decay of the radioisotope used to study red blood cells. Study red blood cells. Um, I see that here in the data table. Um, and that is iron 59. So I see that here. They went ahead and told me it's iron 59. Um, and I just need to know what this guy is and this guy is. So since I know that it's a beta mode for decay, one of these particles has to be a beta. So I'll go ahead and write that in. Um, you could just use an E with a mass of 0 and a charge of negative 1. And then iron has... Um, in this case, a mass of 59, and all iron atoms have the same charge. You just need to check your periodic table to find that. Um, and I'm checking now, but iron has 26 protons in its nucleus. So that means that it has a mass of 26, or excuse me, a charge of 26. And that matters because we need that for the algebra. So when I'm figuring out what this other particle is. I'm just going to do a little bit of algebra and I'll do the A's first or the masses that are on top and the A's are going to be something like this. 59 um, equals 0 plus A and then in terms of Z's I would say 26 equals negative 1 plus Z and Let's see, for A, I think A has to be 59, because 59 plus 0 is 59. And then for Z's, um, I'm thinking it needs to be 27. And my reasoning for that is that um, if I have a 27 here, then I subtract 1, I get 26. So 
the particle has to have a mass of 59, and it has to have a charge of 27. And the only element who has a charge of 27, I'm just taking advantage of what I know about atomic numbers here, is uh, cobalt. So that has to be your answer, is uh, cobalt 59. Last question. The radioisotopes carbon-14 and nitrogen-16 are present in a living organism. Carbon-14 is commonly used to date a once-living organism. And then it says a sample of wood, so it's a once-living organism, is found to contain one-eighth as much carbon-14 as is present in the wood of a living tree. So when I see the fraction one-eighth remaining, I actually just sort of visualize the fraction one-half, but I visualize it three times, because if I do that, I'll see that two times two is four, times two is eight. And the only way you could have one-eighth remaining is if you've been through three half-lives. And they want to know what is the approximate age in years, so I need to know how long a half-life is for carbon-14. And um, you can use table N for that. So look that up on table N. I'm doing that as well. And on my reference table, it says that a half-life for carbon-14 is 5715 years. So 5715 years. You just need to multiply it by the number of half-lives that passed. In this case, it's 3. So you punch that into your calculator. And 5715 times 3 comes out to be 17,145 years. So there's my review of nuclear chemistry for your exam. Um, so make sure you study this, make sure you have notes for this, and um, good luck studying for your exam.